And thanks for being here, Jeff. Happy to. So for those of us in the audience who are familiar with BCG Digital Ventures, I'd say that a lot of us do consider it the sleeping giant leader of blockchain technology. Your firm has been part of the space since, what, 2011? You've seen and you've advised how many projects now? For Over 120. 120, that's, that's right. From your perspective, what's the most exciting part of blockchain tech? Well, I think we're not interested in the ICOs and uh, the, the, the things that I think a, a lot of people are focused on right now. We're more focused on what it can mean for uh, new economies that can get created from it. Mm -hmm. And if you think about the idea, and you saw some of the plays, uh, slides here about the democratization of IT, um, and you start to think about where commerce has evolved from, like we, we kind of call the first generation economies were kind of those direct economies. We, we've done that for 15,000 years, right? Humans have been uh, commercing directly. And then obviously humans are inherently lazy because we have a third lobe. So we build tools and we create things to make it easier for ourselves. And, then, and thus emerges the digital economy. Uh, where largely there's intermediaries. And if you look at some of the largest companies in the world, they're intermediaries. They're standing between you and I, right? right? And, you know, Facebook makes it easier to find your friends. Amazon makes it easier to buy something. Google makes it easier to fi find something, and so on, and so on, and so on. And then as you go to the, the third generation, which we, we call decentralized and open, uh, that could lead to significant opportunities where you democratize IT, empower the person, uh, and that gets pretty exciting uh, for us. And that's where we're, we're focused more on the economies and where the economies are going uh, and then what enables those economies. Absolutely. Uh, so we, you actually mentioned quite a few things. Let's dig into some of those things you mentioned. Uh, something that really interests a lot of us here in this crowd when we speak to individuals who have overseen so many different projects across different industry verticals, you know, can blockchain technologies disrupt incumbents? And if so, which ones? Which ones do you think have the most potential for disruption? Well, I think you know, that's a good question. I think you have to understand where, where the blockchain is, right? And we kind of consider the blockchain where the internet was in 1996. There's a lot of irrational exuberance. Um, back in 1996, 97, everything was www.something.com. Everybody had something.com. And now we're starting to see everything something.blockchain. <laughs> Uh, dot .io. Dot, dot .io. Ex exactly. <laughs> uh, so you, ha you have to understand where the blockchain is, and it's pretty early. Uh, it, it, you, we, we expect a correction. Uh, we expect a crypto winter, I think, as some of the people ta talking about it, which will get rid of the business models that don't have fundamentals. Uh, you also have to understand where, where the blockchain is. You know, you've got what we call kind of first protocol Bitcoin, which, you know, is a few columns in a spreadsheet and an access script, right? And then Ethereum came along, added logic to that. Uh, and now we're, we're getting pretty interested in what we call these third protocols, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we've been significantly uh, uh, investing and, uh, and working with the Definity protocol. We're pretty excited about that because it solves a couple of the two functions that we think need to be solved. First and foremost is performance. Mm -hmm. Um, and right now, you're not going to go replace Visa with a blockchain. I mean, Definity, which I think is, you know, running at speeds 600 times faster than what we see in Ethereum right now in their test nets, uh, processes a block inside of a second, while well, your computer can process millions of transactions inside of a second. So we're still not in a, in a space where it's going to be right for everything, but mm -hmm. there are some great places where transparency where you see that transparency and that trust function start to vibrate where things get too big uh, and where performance can be met. So there's lots of areas in health that we see that could be opportunistic. We see a lot of areas in industrial goods and transportation uh, and what have you. But I, I think less in the, in, the, in the heavy payment financial transaction volume things right. are not going to be happening on the chain anytime soon. Absolutely. So it makes sense you mentioned a few things about the state of the technology not being where it needs to go. Let's kind of imagine we've overcome those obstacles. On one of our previous calls, you'd mentioned you know, the concept of Web 3.0. Okay, to get from where we are today and to get us there, where should everyone in this room be focusing their efforts? Well, it, it, that's a good question too. So if you, if you think about like, you, you, you can't digitize a process you don't understand, right? And you sure as hell can't decentralize something that hasn't been digitized. Right. So. 
you know, we look at it, first you've got to understand the, the, the framework that we're approaching is you've got to understand first the value chain from point A to point B, who are all the actors within that value chain, right? right. And then second, what are, the, what, are the, what are the technology components in that value chain? Right. Um, and then third, what can you decentralize? Um, there's only certain things that can decentralize. So, what are they? Well, it, it depends on you know identity or, or different things. But what are the components you can decentralize? More of a rhetorical question than actually answer because each industry is different. And then finally, what are the economics behind that? I mean, I can go launch a company and create tokens. There's no value, <laughs> right? You, 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 economy has to have value, right? You have to be able to make something for less, sell something for more, and talk to more people. Otherwise, they're not going to move to the decentralized economy, right? Okay. You, need, you need to have friction there to, to, that you're solving, otherwise your solution is in search of a problem. So understanding the value chain, understanding the technology behind the value chain, understanding what components I can decentralize, and then understanding how that decentralized activity will create value. Okay. And there's where tokens will attain value, and then thus tokens will retain value. If you want to go tokenize and replace just standard equities, well, fine, do it. But that's not really doing anything, right? Mm -hmm. You're just finding a different means to seek financing. Right. Uh, I don't think that's going to change the world or solve anything for us. And I think that transitions pretty well into uh, this next question. Uh, we've also discussed on the phone previously uh, the separability or inseparability of token economics, right? whatever that means to all of us, the different forces that drive token e economics and projects that are decentralized. What is your perspective on that now? As far as token economics or yeah. as far as, well, again, I think the tokens have to follow the, the law of it economics right you've got to you've got to be able to create value somehow and you know if you, if you can you know we saw up there i think where they were talking about facebook we took forever making friends now you can yeah well facebook stands in between you every time you share a picture and i share a picture right. they make money well in a decentralized world technically you would make money doing that but how so there is what friction are you solving? Because otherwise, for you, Facebook is just probably is still good enough for what I'm doing, um, unless you can show me an easy way to make value in that in that terms. Right. We launched a, 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 a program called Tracer, which is the first, I think, pan industry platform ever in the blockchain that's moving toward it. It's called TRACR. -R. It tracks diamonds from the ground to the finger. Unlike a lot of technology companies that say they have proof of concepts, this is actually a real business with De Beers and a number of people that are participating with it. And the idea there is um, that that economy will, be, will value be created because I can prove providence of the diamond. Mm -hmm. I can prove it's not a synthetic. Mm -hmm. I can prove it's not a blood diamond. Therefore, arguably, people will pay more for it. Then, because I can decentralize that and I can remove a lot of the intermediaries and the financing activities that go along there, I can obtain more value. Or, or reduce the cost to actually produce that diamond. And then finally, ideally, more participants will, will start to play with that or participate in that economy, thereby increasing the overall value. Absolutely. So those are things that we look at. Um, that's, that's what we're focused on. We spun one of our components out, out of DV. That's going to be one of the largest foundries focused on blockchain that's got a significant capital arm behind it, hopefully. Uh, and uh, a number of components in and around and establishing these economies. But that's where we get excited. That's where we think things can go. How you, if you tokenize your business, that's fine. That's just a different way of fundraising. But where I think the power of the blockchain and open decentralized blockchains play is creating these new economies. Absolutely. And you mentioned the word pan, pan industry. Um, I want to ask you, what will it take us to, well, actually, no, first and foremost, is it necessary for us to have a pan-industry blockchain to include you know, all those use cases, like the De Beers example that you just mentioned? Or is, it, is our future going to involve blockchains that cover a few industry verticals, or every, there's just lots of fragmentation? Where do you see this, this entire field going? Uh, it, well, I think, one, there, there are no pan-industry platforms right now. Not even the De Beers one is in an open, decentralized environment yet. It still requires performance that doesn't exist, which we're hoping Definity will solve. Um, but there are none. There, aren't, there hasn't been one yet. I mean, it, Bitcoin is a blockchain. Ethereum is a blockchain. Definity will be, as it, when it's released, it's a blockchain, and there's others out there now. But there are no pan-industry plays. And you have to ask your question, well, why not? 
Well, there's a function of a couple of things, why not? One, there's, there's the performance issue, right? They're, they're just not processing writing blocks fast enough to maintain the volume that an industry would need. The second thing you see is the power consumption that goes on. I think we, we, we did this study and we looked at, uh, if you issued tickets to the Rose Bowl on Ethereum, it costs you $9.2 billion. <laughs> So it's not gonna, it's not gonna allow, for, we have to fix these things. And then we have to get people in this room and others focused on building industry plays that actually have economic value behind them. Not just a cool idea of I generated a coin and I'm trying to create provenance. Well, how are you making it either cost less to produce something, sell it for more, or talk to more people? If you can't solve those three things, it's probably not gonna work. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. To take a little bit of a, let's sidetrack this conversation a little bit because you know, we've heard some rumblings in the crowd today and at other conferences uh, about uh, this new venture called BACT. Anyone heard of it? Anyone? BACT? Yeah. The, uh, Intercon the Intercontinental Exchange is the parent company of the New York Stock Exchange and they're working on a, you know, a three-tier solution. It's custodial chip, it's warehousing, it's an exchange, you know, BCG, DV, what does it mean to you? Well, if, if you're going to if you're going to have crypto and you're going to produce in these in this decentralized economy, you need a way to get in and get out of it. And currently, it's pretty damn difficult to get in and get out of Bitcoin and other of these these cryptocurrencies. Whether you think they're relevant or not, there needs to be an efficient exchange. And the backed project was really can we can we establish an efficient way to get in and get out? Um, and it's very early. I mean, we just. We just put this one out there, right? We've, we've been thinking about it for a while. So we're, what makes it exciting is if we can find a ways for people to efficiently get in and get out of these currencies, if we find a way that these become tender and not, you know, capital gains, which currently is the issues behind a lot of them, um, where we don't need little tiny countries in the middle of nowhere like Marshall Islands trying to issue crypto and then the U.S. saying, nope, we're not going to allow that. Um, so we need, to, we need to get... First of all, you need a platform to be able to do that, and I think Bact is one of the, one platform, and there are others that are coming and others that are out there. And then I think second is getting the regulators uh, and the countries to start to begin to trust this as a viable way. And I think that'll be underpinned under can we really establish new economies that operate versus just trying to create uh, alternative investment uh, ways of raising, raising capital. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, we know that we're a little bit short on time, uh, given your busy schedule. So I do want to take this step back and ask a higher, more philosophical question. And that is, you know, in our conversation here thus far, we've mentioned, we fired off several corporate names that many of us in the crowd have heard of. Uh, but it's a little bit, it appears to be at odds with kind of uh, the, the idea that a lot of us in the room were bit by the Bitcoin paper. We were, we had that light bulb go off and we think this is the future of, you know, democratizing solutions and, and sharing, uh, you know, business models that can share revenue. And it's kind of a more fair, fair play world. But the title of this conversation with you is, it involves, you know, the corporate view, the decentralization technologies and how they're viewed by corporate leaders. How do I reconcile the fact that, you know, blockchains are more on the, you know, the libertarian front, the I'm going to share everything front, as opposed to having, you know, these large companies coming in and, work with blockchain technologies, deploy these proofs of concept. You know, how do I reconcile those two things that seem so disparate? Well, I think you, you gotta break that question down a little bit. So if you, if you look at corporates, there, there, there's two types that are gonna participate, right? They're either going to be producers or they're gonna be intermediaries. The producers have a huge opportunity in the blockchain because they can disintermediate the intermediaries. The intermediaries either have an opportunity or a threat, depending on how they, how they choose to look at this. They can pretend to take the blue pill and, and, and go to sleep and not worry about the thing, or they can follow the rabbit hole all the way down, right? This is kind of the, the, the matrix question that I guess happens. Um, I think the producers have a real opportunity. There's a real opportunity to increase economies, increase participation in economies, um, and allow you know, more people to participate in that, right? So that, I think, and allows more people to have income in and around these new economies, and whether you're in Africa or in India or wherever it be, uh, that's where the power of decentralization and democratization of IT can play, right? Mm -hmm. If you're an intermediary, what happens in an intermediary, if you think about just human nature, right? Um, especially here in the US, is something gets too big, 
what we call the trust function starts to vibrate, right? right? That's why you argue the Roman Empire fell, well, you could argue it's the lead in the pipes, but it got too big in the Greek as well, and the imperialism as well, and the U.S. tends to call them monopolies and break them apart, right? We've heard this about Microsoft, heard about Google, and it will come and continue as, as things get big, humans just naturally distrust it. Right. And this is where, the, you know, the, the blockchain and these ideas of open decentralized systems can actually swing the trust back, right? Um, you can empower the individual. We're seeing uh, that opportunity of you owning your own data, and we're seeing what's happening just in Facebook and getting data hacks and the, the Edelman scores are, are, are historical lows. So the conditions are right for blockchain to take off just on the trust function alone. There's enough friction there. The performance issues still lack. So then as a corporate, and you either understand you're a supplier or you're a producer or an intermediary, then in the producer space, we're, the big opportunities are ones with, who have market share that can bring the uptake, because if nobody uses it, it's not going to be valuable. And then, you know, we look at for low transaction volume. So you're not going to go replace visas. So if I'm a producer with high market share and low transaction volume, I'd probably be raising my hand saying, hey, there's, there's a pretty good opportunity. And we're talking to a few corporates in it around that space. Mm -hmm. And we probably have 25 uh, industry plays identified. Uh, as well as a number of marketplaces, which are kind of the horizontal needs of a stable coin, identity, tax, arbitration, right. token translation, all of these other things that have to, have to exist to make this work. And the platform we spun out is really working on the utilities to make these economies work. Because without them, you, you, the economies won't turn on. So you need the protocol layer, as I call it the database layer. Then you need the utility layer, which is that middleware. Then you need all these people building the decentralized apps, which I think will eventually get commoditized, uh, where in digital, that's where all the value is. And in a decentralized world, I think that'll be very commoditized. But you need those three components to make these economies start working. Absolutely. And once, once we are able to achieve those three components, right, how do we get to that point where there's, quote, unquote, mainstream adoption? How do we get from you know, building the right protocols, building the right products, and then actually getting it to the consumer where the consumer uses all these things that you're working on, right? How do we get there? I think for that to happen, you have to build it from small villages, right? Just all startups start really small. Um, I think once you get the protocols performing the way that we think they should, and that, that you'll start to see that start to happen this next year. It's not quite there yet, but we'll start to see some of the, the, the foundations of it. And we kind of look at with Definity and these third generation protocols coming out as kind of where broadband was. What broadband meant to the internet, this is what we see these third protocols. So those performances there will come. You know, our foundry platform that we spun out, they're working on the utilities to get, you know, the middleware translation into those protocols working. Um, and then it's going to come down to the entrepreneurs in this room and others that want to build these apps. And I think those apps where if you take like Uber, for example, well, Uber tries to solve everything. In a decentralized world, I think you'll see, you know, small universities building their own app, doing their own ride sharing, and making their own money, right? We have another one where uh, we're doing it where you would never put your child in an Uber. Why? You don't trust it. Right? But would you put an Uber, would you put your child in a car with a mom driving her child? Probably, because you trust that most likely she'll do well. It's more of a carpooling function. So one of the decentralized ride-sharing plays that we have just to test the viability of this is actually working that in and around schools where mom that are driving make a little bit from that. Moms that are using the service pay a little bit into that. And schools is a, is a, is a gating mechanism also makes money out of that. Absolutely. So I think you'll see more models that look like that, that start small, where they're just building for their, their, their village, if you will, uh, than trying to be the Uber to serve the whole world kind of thing that we're seeing now. Mm -hmm. So thank you for expanding on that point. You know, unfortunately, where we are running out of time, but th there's one last question I have to ask. Um, I remember in 2014, there was <clears throat> this thought piece put out by the Boston Consulting Group. It's a management consulting firm. Um, and I had never heard of such a large firm producing some thought piece on some esoteric, you know, tech maximalist thing called Bitcoin. And I think it might have quoted you back then. Uh, and since seeing that paper and the thought pieces that have since come from that firm, your name has come up a few times. And I really enjoy following the things that you're working on. I've definitely heard of Definity. I'm sure many people in the crowd have. How do we? Uh, if we're interested in knowing more about what you're working on, how do we follow, follow you and your team? Well, DV is a very 
I guess, stealthy organization. We don't market ourselves. We have a couple of our marketing girls over there that are probably saying, uh, yes, we do. But they actually build uh, our eminence in a, in a way that is very, very unique, and they're very, very good at what they do. We use main forums. Our, our main forum of communication at DB is the World Economic Forum. So that's the one we use. Uh, we, we also have this wonderful website that lots of people reach out, but otherwise I would go talk to those, those two standing over there in that corner and they can get you connected to the right people. Um, and we, we like it that way. We're the, we're the largest venture firm in the world by people. We got a thousand. Um, so we don't need to, to market ourselves. Our parent company, which is Boston Consulting Group, brings us into the most exclusive situations. Our corporate access is unparalleled. Uh, our capital access is also quite significant because we tap into all of our corporate partners balance sheets and we carry our own funds as well. Mm -hmm. And then, the, and then the, the foundry platform that we launched that's solely focused on the utilities of the blockchain will be the largest one in the, the 3G space, if you give me that narrative. Uh, and that one's also pretty confident, but those guys uh, can get you connected. All right, so I'll absolutely share their information with the audience um, after the fact, but I know you have to catch a flight. So thank you so much for being here, Jeff. If everyone could please put their hands together for Jeff Schumacher. Thank you all.